Thanks for joining us. Per Holmen Dalin, <laughs> you're a business coach at yes. Sweden Game Arena. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for coming on stage. Patti Toledo, all the way from Sundsvall. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's Not great. That you told. <laughs> Game on mid Sweden. Okay. Yes, excellent. And then we have again on stage, oh. second time today, so popular. Yeah. <laughs> Mattias Lindblad, Flamebait. Pass Patu, the starving artist. That's me. That's you. We can all relate. And last but not least, of Frame Break, Joakim Hedström, CEO. We met last year on stage where you pitched. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when, when this was not a live audience, but no. only a television show. Well, it was a bit of an audience. A bit of an audience. Some nice an audience placards, of, yeah. some goats, I remember. Maybe two-person audience. We're multiplying. Yeah, I love how, how this audience grows. Maybe next year, you know, there will be millions. All those people are following us um, from afar on the video. All right. Current challenges of startups. Um, let me ask: Are the challenges of startups different? What does the word "current" mean? Is are the challenges of startups different now, or are they just different flavors of the same? Per, you've been doing this for a while, so I'm going to ask you to begin. All right. Um, as for current, uh, I guess you mean that for, for now, in this moment right now, uh, comparing to, to before or maybe in the future, but uh, I'd say that my, my feeling uh, when it comes to investments in, uh, in, in, in early startups or indie game studios, when it maybe not become indie studios anymore, but I think that there's uh, much more money in the, in the industry right now. Uh, and more and more investors are looking into projects much more early on than uh, like say for instance three, four, five years ago. That's my general feeling, though I haven't been out uh, <laughs> on any like events uh, for a long time, but uh, that's my general feeling that uh, the teams that we are working with are, are getting approached in a different way uh, much more early on uh, today than before. Interesting. So that's that's an observation, and I I, yeah. I, I can I can share that observation. It yeah. sounds it it looks like there's uh, more money and it, it's getting in earlier. Okay, yeah. interesting point. I don't know if it's a challenge, but let's get back to that. Patti, yeah. uh, can you maybe you explain a little bit what it is that you do at um, Game On Mid Sweden? Um, first. I actually have two jobs, so I will explain both. <laughs> even, even better. Um, I, in Game On Mid Sweden, I'm responsible for developing the hub. So, Vastnodeland is a region that wasn't really known for games before, and they have been seeing what you guys have been doing in Hövde, what has been done in Malmo. There are quite a lot of great initiatives in Sweden for game development. And they felt slightly jealous and decided that they wanted to do it themselves. <laughs> and um, no, they, they thought that they have talents, there are game developers there as well, and they needed support, they needed to be heard, they needed to expand what they were doing. So then they brought me all the way back to Sweden. I have never lived in Sweden before, but I have been here many times uh, to develop the hub and develop the talents there and give in, like start an initiative for game developers to get funded. And when you say they did this, who are they? Uh, you see, the city of Sundsvall and Chrome Force and High Coast, and they are going to kill me if I miss someone. <laughs> and the game companies in, in Sun, most of the game companies are in Sundsvall, but Chrome Force is working with the education. High Coast has the funding, so it's kind of an initiative. Mm -hmm. And they all got together uh, to work on this. So it's an uh, overall region. Uh, uh, effort. And besides that, I'm the director of developer relations from a platform called, a company called Yahaha, which is a new UGC meta, uh, metaverse platform that's going to be released next year. So pretty much I, my job is to help indie developers do things 
in every job that I do. All right, cool. And uh, the current challenges, what, what, what's current about the challenges? Uh, one thing that I know, like today we had a lot of talks talking about how investors are really interested in games now, how there are so many publishers, that are so many opportunities for game developers. I think the biggest challenge now is that with all these opportunities also come a way of responsibility and um, pre like preparedness that the developers need to have. Like, Five years ago, it was the challenge of talking to investors. Nowadays, the investors and the publishers are really well informed. So you can't just go with a basic plan and try to convince them that it's a good idea. Now you really have to be prepared. You really have to know your game economy. You really have to know game design. It, there is a level of attitude and like level of preparedness and an attitude yeah. that the game developers need to change to be able to reach all these opportunities. That's mind blowing because I'm always told, or I used to always be told from developers that, oh, it's so difficult. We have to spend 90% of the time in investor meetings explaining games, explaining the games industry. And now you're saying, they don't have to do that anymore, and that's also bad. Yeah, because now it's the other way around. Now the investors are asking the hard questions, and if the developers are not ready to answer right away, mm. then they blow an opportunity, and sometimes you have a one-time opportunity with that investor or with that publisher. Uh, if, you, if you don't show that you're prepared to talk to them, that you know what to do, you might not have the same uh, uh, let's say first impressions stay. You might have mm. other opportunities to talk with these uh, publishers or with these investors, but the first impression is already there. So yeah, it's a challenge on that. Yeah, and be careful what you wish. Or I don't know if this situation <laughs> is better than the one we used to complain about. All right, Matthias, um, would you call Flamebait a startup? Have you ever called Flamebait a startup? Do you, um, yeah, let's talk about that word in context of your work. Yeah, I don't know, startup is just such a weird, weird word for kind of like a yeah, bunch of guys doing stuff together, I guess. I don't know, I mean, I think, I think actually we, we never were a startup when we were starting up, ironically. I think, I think that was the, the core issue with our team coming in as a young, bunch of students just wanted to make a game that we weren't uh, we weren't a startup we were we were a, a, a game project right uh, so we weren't actually building a company we were building a game and I think many people start from from that side of things and and that could really work out for that one game but the problem is that if that game doesn't f uh, uh, succeed or if it f uh, uh, if it's a massive hit and you don't really have a game plan past that point then you're just like stuck with your trousers down kind of have to deal with with that I don't know if that answered your, your startup question, but I think, I think since, since, since then we have really reevaluated ourselves and maybe we just became a startup this year, maybe. Ooh. Oh, so what, three games in, you're becoming a startup? Yeah, I think we're there now. <laughs> uh, all right, that's really <laughs> cool. Um, and, and when you listen to the findings here about more investment and more difficult questions, is that something that um, echoes in, in your experience? I mean, I, maybe you start, did you start out in the previous era with little investment? And are you now in this new field with too much investment? Or what, what? We're, We've always been organic. So, so investment or not hasn't really been that important for us. So we haven't really been taking the temperature of where things are there. I think, I think the broader the broader issue that has been rising is, is rather that there has been an, a massive increase of competition from the developer side. So even there, if there's a lot of investor attention, it's like they want more stuff, they, they are asking harder questions when I meet with them and they know more stuff and they want to get in early, but they also have so many good games to pick from. And it's harder to get out there because there are no really sneaky tricks that you can pull off to, to, to just make a hit. Like I remember early Steam days, like 2010, like just get your game on Steam Steam and then it will sell. It was kind of that mentality. But then you have the whole democratization process of like apps should be for everyone. Everyone should release apps. It releases the floodgates of, of everyone being able to compete on even terms. And I think that is a good thing because competition is good. We get better games, but it does make it harder for us because you can't really cut any corners anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's more for everybody. Uh, all right, cool. Uh, so Joachim. Thanks for, I saved the best for last, no pressure. Um, so Framebreak, um, 
you're a, you're a fairly new organization, is that right? Yeah, I would say that. And, and would you say that you are, um, I mean, comparing to Matthias' story, did you start with the game first, or did you start with this by the book, make a company? I definitely recognize myself in that. Uh, <laughs> like we had a project we wanted to bring into the incubator, and then at the incubator we learned that, no, you need to be a company, uh, and start working towards that instead. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's definitely been like the hardest part of letting go of everything you kind of learn to uh, focus on the game and instead focus on a business and get out there and start uh, just pitching everything you can. And that's also like the landscape has been interesting because uh, I spent basically all of last year pitching uh, and met a lot of different uh, publishers and such. And getting to talk to them wasn't very hard. Uh, but getting a deal was, since I talked to over 60 of them and didn't get a deal. 60? Yeah. Wow. You were busy. Yeah, I mean, it's what you have to do. And, and what, what, uh, what was your... Um, you were a student here at... Yeah. Exa and what was your discipline? Uh, game writing. Game writer, okay. And now you're um, a business. You're yeah, a I mean, was, I don't think anyone who goes to game writing becomes a game writer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry to... <laughs> tell you uh, it's gonna be hard work to get there but uh, yeah no game writers usually end up uh, as project managers uh, usually because in the first game project we get a really cool narrative idea taken away from us and then this next project we decide to be the project managers to never have it taken away from us again uh, oh so it comes out of a painful learning kind of yeah but it's valuable learning uh, it's the best way to learn a lesson well I mean another way to think about it and, you know, let me try this on you then. Uh, Rami just talked about communication and how important communication is. And maybe game writers are good at communication. So maybe that's why they have a sp specific role to fill. I mean, that's uh, what writing is, right? You want to send a message in some way, and that's communication. So I think there is a correlation of game writing to becoming CEOs for all you budding game writers out there. And do I remember correctly, did you take on investment? We got bought up. You were acquired, yeah, yes. By Amplifier, actually, which uh, Rami said was, they're out there, they're buying. So, <laughs> yeah, you can talk to them. Henrik is here. Hit him yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, we've seen him. He's been on this stage, actually, in that very chair. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, go find him. Uh, how, tell us, uh, sorry, um, uh, you will also get to talk, but no I find worries. this really interesting. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, how, how did that happen? I mean, what, what, you, you had all this, when you did the 60 meetings, were you always looking for an investor to acquire your company, or did that happen on the way? Yeah, it was actually not the plan. We were planning to you know, stay more indie, to just get a publishing deal, and then maybe get bought up, or you know, see what kind of opportunities we'd get. We just wanted to, like, can we get this one game out the door uh, with a good deal or something, and see where our company is at after that. And then during that, I think actually, Pad, you hooked me up with a person who knew a person, and then at some point we were talking to Amplifier yeah. uh, and they put forward uh, basically like, have you considered being bought up? And <laughs> now we have considered it. <laughs> uh, and the case they put forward was uh, basically, uh, you know, it was comparable to our publishing deals and we could discuss, do we want to try the, you know, the maybe we'll make it publishing deal or do we take the more safe option of we get bought up, there is a plan, they want to not just see what we can do with this game, but what we'll do with the next game and so on. So that felt like much more safe. So uh, I was actually confused for a bit because for a while this panel was called like the, what, the problems with indie panel. Yeah, indie, yeah. And I was concerned because I'm not indie anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're major now. Uh, but I'm, I'm just here to like really argue for like, it's good to be a sellout. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is safety there, uh, but also- at, Come to the dark side. <laughs> exactly, but also at places like Amplifier and other investors are now noticing that like giving small studios, indie studios like us, uh, almost like free reign on creativity while still you know having some business obligations to fulfill but letting us uh, continue to achieve our vision as if we were an indie studio is profitable because these games work uh, it's now proving itself to be a worthy business model so I think you can really take that advice of like go out there make the studio you want to make and start pitching that studio to investors it's possible I mean, it, this was almost like it's orchestrated because you talked ab about the theory and when, then we came all the way to the practical implementation yeah, of that. I, I, I said was this your game plan always? 
Uh, for, were you like the puppet master? Yeah, oh, I see this be, coming. Let's yeah, for make them to be acquired. Great. Yeah, no, uh, no, it wasn't. But to to connect back to yeah, uh, I mean, what in this case Amplifier is uh, is uh, proposing to startups uh, at at an early stage is uh, something that I've lived through all my years working at the incubator. I mean. These guys are usually about creating that game. They are a creative uh, individual and and running a company. I mean, it's it's hard to have 60 pitches uh, during one year. And uh, um, so what Amplifier is doing is write up a lot of game developers alley in, in that sense. So it's really, really smart. Um, I mean... Uh, Providing them with funds to to make their dreams come true and uh, and and so it's 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 fabulous. It I w I mean we we encourage it uh, in some cases because we see what happens with people when they are put uh, into a lot of stress uh, because um, yeah they're doing something that they might not want to do uh, pitching running a company and, and so on. So, yeah, and that might just become a challenge because uh, as they are hunted down by investors, they, you know, oh, the clock is ticking, we need to answer them early on, and, and that puts them in a stressful situation when they want to be creative, I would say. Hmm. Can I jump in? Yeah, the, please, Patty, uh, yeah. Not only that, I think a lot of people misunderstand what it is to work with a publisher or an investor. Oh, yeah. Like if if you are unprepared to to negotiate a deal or uh, and and know what you want from an investor or what you oh, yeah. want from the publisher, you can put yourself in a situation oh, yeah. that is going to last the next ten years. It can destroy careers. Oh, so yeah. it's it's I think this is a big challenge as well. Like there are all these opportunities, all all these things going around, all this competition for things and. People might have the feeling that because there is a lot of competition, you have to go really fast and decide something, get any deal, go and do, but then you have to follow through. You have to be able to deliver. You have to be able to deliver that for many years to mm -hmm. come. Depending on the game you are doing, it might be two, three, four years of your life developing it. And if you hate the situation that you are, you can't fall back either. You can't. Yeah. Just say, oh, I didn't like you. Can, here's your money back. It doesn't really work <laughs> this way. So it, yeah. it's, it, that's a big challenge as well. Yeah. But, uh, so that sounds great. Uh, we all, you know, now we're all sold on the idea of, of selling out early and being in the comfortable you know, embrace <laughs> of a bigger company that will make sure you get your lunch on time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, the dark side of that, isn't that that you give up control of your destiny? Your, your fate will be in the hands of somebody else in a faraway boardroom. Matthias, I don't want to put words in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, th thank you, thank you. Uh, um, I mean, yeah, that, that's probably why we've always worked alone, because we have a very strong vision of where we want to take our company and where we want to take our games. And, and it doesn't usually fit with a bunch of suits in a room. There might be options out there for people where it makes sense, but also at the, at the end of the line, I think, I think developers should be reaping the rewards of, of, their, of their labor, right? And, and I'm sure you can get that early seed money to, to, to kind of get you kick up and start uh, starting to run, but, but yeah, you, you want to be able to kind of cash, cash that back and keep making more awesome games. And w when you started, uh, before, I mean, when you started self-publishing, uh, did you also, did you look into the option of a publisher or, or an investor? Did you go to, mm. did you pitch your uh, Passepartout game? Uh, yeah. How, I, what I, was that like? Yeah, we've, we've pitched every game to a publisher and investors um, just to kind of, kind of get a sense of, of their reaction and also see like what would be on the table if we wanted to go down that route. Now it's never come to it. I, I remember meeting... Um, uh, one, I know uh, the, the CEO of, of Congregate uh, back in 2016, I think it was, uh, right before, uh, like six months before Passport was about to launch, and I pitched to him and says, "I love this. I lo it looks great. You shouldn't get a publisher." Was his comments to me. You should do it y yourself. And it's like, damn, John, 
you're, you're a cool guy. Okay. <laughs> but those okay. are good publishers. Yeah. The good publishers mm. are the ones that understand you don't need me, do it yourself. Mm. The bad ones are usually the ones that are going to try to convince you that you can't do anything without them. Mm. But the good ones, they know how to differentiate. And the investors as well. Mm. The good ones are the ones that will tell you, look, too early. Don't put us mm. in now. Don't do it yourself. Go do the stuff and then come back. Because then they are being honest about the project. Mm -hmm. right. right, great. So communication and honesty. But when you, when you self-published your game, you had to learn a lot of things about marketing and launches and platforms and customer support and, and all that stuff. And, and you also, I mean, you were, your games have been successful. You, you've, you've made some money. Have you thought of publishing other people's games because mm -hmm. I, I kind of see a pattern like when you've done all that work you, those people doing the marketing they don't have enough titles to launch so they're kind of bored at their job so it's time to bring in some third-party titles have that occurred to you we had we had it as early discussions when we had Passport 2 be a big hit like maybe it would make sense to start a publishing branch down the line but then we kind of quickly discovered like do we want that responsibility and can we really do that within our current outfit usually it would mean I, I think it would mean that we would have ha have to hire a bunch of more people and then suddenly we are a big corporation and then we're like 30 people and we have middle managers and it's like this is not the life I want to uh, live because we're not only here to to make games we're not only here to make a, a company and we're also here to build our own lifestyle. Like, what life do I want to live and what do I want to work with? And can I see myself being a, a, a part of like a big cogwheel hierarchy bureaucracy? I hate bureaucracy. It's the worst thing I, I know. Maybe that's not for me. So for us, or at least for me, and I kind of, kind of properly pulled out the rest of the, of the co-founders to the same direction. It's like, keep ourselves small, keep it agile, uh, so we can just be this like dynamic, rapid, firing squad of, no, not a firing squad, shit, sorry. Um, um, yeah, we do cool shit, and we, we enjoy doing that. Mm. All right, mm. fair enough. Can I disrupt again? Yeah, of course, uh, yeah, it's I'm a panel, uh, please, feel free. Time. Did you have a plan B? Because in your case, great, the game was mm. a success, awesome. Mm. Did you have a plan when you were doing, if this fails, what was the plan B? Or it was like, no, we know we're going to succeed. Oh, no, we didn't think we would <laughs> succeed. Not <laughs> we did not go in with those, those ambitions. I, uh, our plan B was to, to fall back to uh, either doing consulting or side jobs while figuring out the next steps uh, of making a, a, another game. And I think, I think, I don't know how long Flamebait would have lasted if, if we had another failure after that. I don't think we m probably wouldn't have that tenacity. And I think if, you're, if you find yourself in that position, it makes sense to take in capital to kind of just make life work so you can, so you can start getting those games out. Cool. Joachim, um, since you have an investor now, do you th do you, does that mean you don't need a publisher? Uh, in our case, it's a bit weird. Uh, we're doing kind of an experimental self-publishing, but with amplifiers assistance thing. Uh, and I don't know enough about it to explain it, <laughs> because it's all very experimental. We're basically, like, they're finding out, like, what can we do ourselves, and what do we need help with, and how do we find that help? Uh, so I'm probably not the right person to ask. But So it sounds like it's not a clear-cut, you know, crossroads. We go with publishing, or we go with uh, investment. They seem, it seems that your investor can provide some services yeah. similar to, to games publishing. Similar, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, w w w w what are your challenges then? I mean, you, you, it seems that you found the answer. Everything, kind you of. just have to hack away and make the game. And well, yeah, we <laughs> had to make a game first. But uh, that's basically it. And that was part of the deal was, you know, they have invested in our future. So we're not you know, expected to, uh, like, ask them, like, hey, what should we do? We, we should be doing what we want to do. That's what they've invested in. So we tell them we want to take our studio in this direction. We want to make this kind of game. Then they can, of course, say, okay, can you back that up? With, do you know that game is going to be profitable? Because, mm. uh, of course, that is a question we do have to answer compared to maybe being completely independent. And if you have a big enough buffer, you can do whatever game you want. Uh, we still have two make a game that will be profitable, but that will still be a game we want to make. Uh, so that's kind of the balance we have. And so it's not like, you know, a bunch of suits telling us, mm. like, oh, make this game because it's profitable. It's more like, oh, we have this fun game idea that we think will be a good fit. 
Uh, I forgot your question. No, that's fine. Your answer was more interesting than my question anyway. <laughs> okay. But uh, so talking about that then, you, you, so as you're owned by Amplifier, you also have other companies that they have invested in. So yep. they're like your sister companies. Do you have any, I mean, do you get support from them? Do you work together with them? Can you learn from them? How does that work? Yeah, there's a bit of an uh, internal uh, network within Amplifier, and they're also kind of exploring new ways we can learn from each other, because again, uh, they've gotten a lot of studios over the last year, so suddenly like, there's a lot of knowledge here. How do we figure out how to best share this? So some of it is just you know, one on one. I've got you know, uh, some of the other CEOs I can call when I feel imposter syndrome and need <laughs> someone to tell me that no, I'm going doing a fine job, I mm -hmm. guess. Uh, but then we're looking at, you know, OK, so do we have someone that has done you know, similar tech with you know, maybe this other studio is really good with Unreal Engine. We should probably message them, see if their programmer has some time for a you know, Discord talk or something. So yeah, there's definitely like information exchange happening, uh, but we're also improving the ways we're doing it. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. That brings the topic of community back that was also touched upon previously. But maybe, Per, I come back to you because now our job was to talk about current challenges of startups. And we kind of talked about current, and we kind of talked about challenges, mm. and we kind of talked about startups. Yeah. So I think we've done our homework now. <laughs> and now we can just have fun and talk about whatever we like. Uh, but when you listen to this, uh, and you hear about the different business decisions mm. and strategy decisions, how, how does that resonate with you? Is this the kind of discussions that you have with the, with the companies that are incubated? Uh, yeah, uh, of course. Um, those are definitely, I mean, we always want to prepare them for those options uh, that they, they need to realize that there is an option to, to go with uh, either venture capital or a publisher or whatever. And, and I mean, you shouldn't be at that position where you have a knife on your throat just to to then you start pitching to for investors because then your plan is didn't work out in the first place and then you were trying to orientate yourself without a map in the in the first place so um, um, and and that's what we early on kind of we want the teams to to realize what they are up to what what is what is the scope of this game and we always want to uh want them to you know if 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 you had the money what would you do with the project then i mean f for instance in in Joachim's, uh um example there uh, the, the game is totally different now i i, I reckon from when we sat down and talked about it. I mean, uh, now it's your dream project, more likely than what you had Pretty back much. then. You were held back by your realities somehow because um, uh, there is a tomorrow and there are bills to pay and, and, uh, and stuff like that. So yeah, we, we always, yeah, we, we put all the team in front of investors or publishers even though they want to grow organic because there can be an input from the industry that might be worthwhile for them to listen to i mean i can only tell from my perspective but the industry itself are more up to date and they can have a vision of of, of your game idea that is beyond what i can imagine when i'm trying to paint the picture for them Sort of. But it's always back to the, the developers themselves to, to make that decision. And, and if they want to go that way, we, we are there to, to help them uh, to, to reach that, uh, that goal mm. in that case. So, I mean, so far we've talked about business strategy challenges. It, this has all been about business strategy. Do I take investment? Do I go with a publisher? Do I self I mean, this is business, but there must be other challenges as well. Creative challenges. What kind of technologies should we be using? What about disagreement in the team? What are some of those challenges? 
Patti, tell us about the hardest part. Um, I think the hardest part nowadays, it, uh, well, it's not the hardest. There are several things that are really hard. Uh, we talked about a little, like Rami talked about a little bit before, is finding the people from the very beginning. How do you find the right people to develop your game idea with? Like you, if you have, how do you actually tailor your idea to be the best game that it can be? Uh, without limiting yourself. Uh, there are, in technolo technologically, there are so much more that we can do nowadays that we could do 10 years ago. Like, there are amazing, uh, like, amazing tools like uh, Unreal and Unity became so much better. You have the meta human that you can have animations that you never even thought it was possible. You can do AR, you can do uh, VR. You, there is the whole metaverse discussion as well. I think one of the biggest challenge now is keeping it, keeping a focus when deciding what is your first product at the same time of being fully creative and able to expand uh, your ideas like to its full potential. People tend to either be very focused and say, I'm going to do a game that makes money and that limits their creativity a lot. And other teams try to be fully indie and go really crazy and do the biggest idea that they can have and then they have the difficulty of not having the length, like the right legs to do that length. The, the balance is really complicated, especially if you are a first time developer with no experience. And, and, and like I say, there are solutions for there, that of course, like mentorship, like what you guys are doing is great. Uh, this kind of conference when you can ask people that did, did it independently or did it with publishers, like you can ask people around, but for a lot of people it's really hard to ask. It's really hard to, to get this information. They feel very shy, so it's, it's a challenge. Okay, that's really interesting. So, so I, I have, how, how do you make, how do you put together a team? Mm. So the people aspect and how do you focus, how do you decide where, whether to focus or to go after the infinite opportunities? How do you keep your sights straight? Uh, Matthias, what, what's the hardest part? I mean, you don't have to comment on, on Patty's no, no, no. suggestions. Feel free to add. I, th I think the hardest part, especially if, if like for, for us back in the day, and I think for many students right now looking to start a startup is, is to be mature enough to understand where you want to take the company. Because like, who the hell knows where they want to go when they're like 22? Like, I don't want to do it. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I barely know now, I think. All right, like, are we mature enough to make those decisions? And that is, that is, that is a very difficult challenge because like, we have been notoriously bad at being focused on one thing. We made three wildly different games in our, our lifetime. And, and, and that has been a very fun, but it's hard to build a company around that. And, and uh, that's why, what, what I meant early on when I said we began, became a startup this year is that this year was, was the year where we finally found, I feel at least, our company strategy, our vision, our values, and where we want to take the company. Like we are a company that makes games that inspire to create. That is our, that is our mm -hmm. core in everything. And that makes life so much easier. It, it, sh it narrows down, it unlocks creativity by making a, a, a smaller corridor to work with. And it helps with all the, the, the decisions we have to make. Like we can just ask ourselves, does this help us inspire people to create? If the answer is no, why are we doing it? And then, then, then we can just work from that premise. And I think if we would have had that and were mit, mit mature enough to, to be able to live by that, that, that would have been awesome. Really cool. So you found your, your mission statement. Mm -hmm. You defined your compass. Mm -hmm. um, okay, cool. And, and what, uh, Joachim, what's your hardest part? About building a team? Uh, no, no, overall. Oh What's your, I mean, in your work life. Uh, yeah. Uh, we can talk about <laughs> life in general over beer <laughs> later, but uh, in yeah, your work no, life. Yeah, I'll see you. Um, but uh, I would say uh, one hard part just to build onto the others is uh, finishing your first project, actually delivering, and then dealing with the aftermath. Uh, even if you, you know, the team steps up and everything works great and you manage to uh, release a game, and then, yeah, walking forward after that is kind of when we really struggled uh, for the first time as like, okay, we've done this, can we do this all over again? Uh, and one of us couldn't and went away and got a stable job instead, which cannot blame them. Mm. Uh, but then the rest of us decided, okay, we can try this again. But we had, you know, after the first time you had to 
you really learn how to manage your expectations and set really way more realistic goals and start, you know, really becoming a company instead of a project again. Like, okay, we've finished a project, how do we start chaining projects together and turn into some kind of content machine, I guess, which is what a, a game company should be. When did you start talking about what your next game should be, what your second game should be? When did that conversation first take yeah, place? Yeah, like a few weeks after releasing our first one, which is not the right time. Uh, that should have started happening beforehand. So already uh, we learned a lot from that. And then the next game we only worked on for three months before deciding to drop it because that we had decided that like, okay, you cannot work on a game for much longer before you can work on a game for only three months and already then decide if it's worth pursuing pretty much. You can already start pitching your game like a month in. You barely need like a couple of assets and a, you know, a slide. Uh, and then you can start going places and pitching your game and see is there interest in this game? Because even if you have a good idea, you might not have traction for that game. So you put that away, put that, you know, maybe one day, but you drop that and you move on and then repeat this process as many times that it takes. Now, ironically, only took us one try. Uh, <laughs> before that game got us traction enough to one thing led to another. Now we're bought, you know, still making that game. But also, as Per said, it's barely the same game. Uh, it has gone through its own multiple iterations. That's still like, you know, uh, it, it's just killing your darlings over and over. Uh, and people need to learn how to deal with that or the team is going to break apart. And that yeah, reminds Patty. me of another challenge that it's, I think it's the biggest challenge, especially here in the Nordics, people have difficulty accepting that, is the acceptance of failure. Yeah. And that failing, it's fine. Like when you fail, you're learning. It's very hard to learn from success. It's not that it's great to be successful. That's not the point. But usually if you are successful, you think every, you did everything right. And when you fail or the small parts that you fail is where you actually realize the, the you learn and you improve and, and you learn how to kill your darlings really early and, and to move on and to build up. I think that's a big challenge for a lot of developers is to learn that failure yeah. is not a problem. And, and you shouldn't be afraid to fail, fail. just go for it. Maybe because there's so much negative uh, connotations attached to, to, to that work. Fail, Maybe yeah. when I listen to your story, it's more like you were testing this idea. And if you test something, you don't assume that the outcome will be a success. Is that it's fair yeah, to say? It's, again, like Rami said, it's another coin flip. You flip that coin, you see where it's end up, and now uh, you need to let that go and move on to the next one. But your first project was driven by passion and then you really wanted yep. to do it. And then the second one was like completely cold. Let's define <laughs> yeah. the point where we give up on this. It's, it's a bit <laughs> like you need to be pragmatic, but also still like identify, can we be both pragmatic, make a realistic game that will actually sell and has an audience, but is also a fun, cool, interesting game that we want to make. Mm -hmm. And there is actually a ton of games like that. Uh, but you just need to learn to like have this discipline of like, okay, we cannot just go completely wild with our ideas. We can have cool ideas and then we see them through a market perspective. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing, like, we are very successful people in our own way, in different, in different ways. But most game developers, when they do their first game, they, they do fail. And I know the word is bad, but they do fail. They put a game out and they don't sell. And sometimes they hardly get anything to, to survive. And that's the reality. But the really cool thing about game development is that your failure now is a portfolio that you can tell publishers and investors that you learned upon, and your second project will be a ton better because you learn all these lessons from the first one. Uh, every publisher and every investor will tell you that hardly nobody makes success in the first game. That's why they, they, everybody's like, wow, you did a game that is successful in the first one, because it's really hard to do. It's a really hard task to do. 99% of the people fail in the first game. And it's important for developers to learn that that's fine. It's part of the system. It's how it works. Cool. Yeah. So th that's definitely a challenge to kill off the darlings uh, for, for the indie game studios, uh, as well as for me to be able to, when I realize that this will probably not work, it's hard for me to 
kind of, you know, say that in a way that that these people realize it in themselves. I'm not telling it, but that's why it's so important to have data that is showing that maybe this not uh, this is not going anywhere. Don't you have like a good cop, bad cop routine or something like that? Yeah, we do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I will. I will. Uh, ask you to think about I will I ask you I encourage you to uh, think about questions for the panel because we have a few more minutes and here's a good opportunity for you to tap into the wisdom to drill into the heads not literally that would be kind of gory but if you if there's something I should have asked and I haven't and you think you have a good question or a bad question any question please start phrasing it in your mind in your mind. Matthias, it almost sounds like it would have been better if you hadn't succeeded on your first game. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Yeah, you are the light of hope. There is hope of making money on the first game. He is the example oh, yeah. but I, of I it. Think, I think I have to break that myth because, like, I mean, we made five to ten prototypes and launch those yeah. with complete and utter failure. I think, I think the problem is that you should never reach the point where you ship something on Steam and it fails there. That is the ideal and, and we've done that as well. Like, uh, every, no one is perfect, right? Yep. But, but that way you, you kind of have to test your games before they, they launch on the market by doing small stuff and, and getting that verification like, okay, this game has that secret sauce, the thing that someone, that, that fantasy that people really want. And that means that we should continue making it and we should ship it and people will like it. Yeah, it's like Rovio made 50 games before they got to Angry Birds. That's the story that we all love. Mm -hmm. But people forget that they did 50 mm. prototypes of mm. games that didn't go anywhere before that. Yeah. yeah, but w I mean, that's a really insightful strategy to, to make, you know, a, a situation for yourself where you can try and, and test and fail small. How did you how did you come to that insight so early? Did they teach you this at Skövdeag Skola or did they teach? Did Per tell you this in the incubator? How did you f figure that out? It was part of our rebellious phase when we didn't <laughs> really accept the, the, the incubator program at that time. <laughs> yeah, so, so we kind of revolted because we were making a mobile app that, that, with, with the incubator uh, that like, basically counted your steps. So basically Pokemon Go before Pokemon Go, okay? We were ahead of the curve. Uh, deal with it. Um, <laughs> But, I like but, that concept. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> yeah, but but we hated making it. We didn't. We made a game for a device. We didn't play with the game type of game. We didn't like for a type of audience. We didn't understand. So it was like all the all the bad badness. And then we said uh, at the final pitch at the incubator, we just pitched that we would be prototyping instead. That is our company. We're prototyping new games and seeing what 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 sticks. And I remember Johan Hamrian saying, "Are you just gonna throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks?" And it's like, "Yep, exactly." Uh, he, he, I think he meant that condescendingly, but, but, but <laughs> that's exactly what we turned, uh, what we did. And we said, okay, how can we make as many prototypes as possible? Like, okay, two weeks per prototype, and we were studying at the time, so we had to do that stuff as well, right? And, and then we just churned out a, a ton of prototypes, Passport 2 being one of them, made in, I think, one and a half weeks. Uh, got it oh. out there, uh, and that was the one that kind of clicked, uh, where we got influencers playing the game, people loving it. They saw kind of this fantasy that Sebastian was talking about earlier, um, and, uh, and that's what we decided to build onto. The funny part is that they created the hyper-casual system before hyper-casual existed. <laughs> you were ahead of the curve, because hyper-casual games are all about that mm. now. You put a video out, test it, see what sticks, and mm. then you develop if it sticks. So. Does that mean I can call my, myself a visionary now? Like yeah, pretty maybe much. Maybe philanthropic yeah. visionary. Yeah. Yeah. Prophet, I think, is <laughs> <more> <laughs> <vision>. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> Questions, folks. Anyone? Do you have a question? You've, been, you've, you've had all day inspiration, oh, information, like knowledge, wisdom being force-fed uh, into there, your brains. There is one there. Oh, you there's one? To, oh, great. You have to walk to the microphone. Please, do the, the walk of, of we're, glory we're all the way up here. We're making new exercise now. Uh, yeah, and, and that's a great animation sequence once again. I love how the badge pops. Yeah, it's a good walk cycle. Yeah. Love the shirt. Thanks. No, it seems no. to be... Keep talking, and uh, I'm sure they'll figure it out. There's somebody needs to push a lever up. Have we lost the uh, technician? <laughs> Just ask your question, we'll yeah. repeat it to you. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah. Oh. Guidelines. Do you feel like you can? Oh, here you go. Um, any hints, maybe, to as a voice? Yes, something that you need to like test till you get a grasp for it. How do you calibrate the scope of your game? How do you know if it's too wide or too narrow? Yeah. Mm. Uh, excellent question. Thank you. Fantastic question. Yeah. Uh, do you have the answer, or is the question just too mind-blowingly good <laughs> so it cannot be answered? It's an excellent question. It's a very difficult topic as well. I think I think the rule of thumb is that you, your products are almost always overscoped. It, like you can always make it smaller, and you should try to make it smaller. And I think I think rather make make it smaller and then build on top of it if yeah. you magically find that extra time, which you won't find usually. Um, but, but I think it also depends on what type of position you come from. If you have a lot of experience, then you start to get a sense of how long does things usually take. But if you're, if you're starting out, maybe you can, you can talk to some, someone more senior, like this is the game we're thinking to do, this is the team, how long would you think this would take to make? And they can look at your projection and say, this, is, this looks okay, or this looks way out of line, I, I, that type of thing. And I also think that it's important, especially when you're starting up, to measure, like, estimate all, all the different deadlines or tasks within your product and so forth. Okay, we thought this would take three days, it took four weeks. And this is a consistent pattern with our project planning, which probably suggests that we have a project that's going to take 400% to the amount of time that we estimated. And then you're in big trouble, right? So those are my, my general tips. Brilliant. Anyone else want to add to this? I mean, yeah, you'll you know, get a sense of how things are progressing during like the prototyping stage uh, when you're You've, if you're pitching it, you hopefully start prototyping it. So you'll start to get a sense of like how hard was this to do. And then if you have plans for future features, you're yeah, asking someone. Because uh, a big red flag is, you know, you know, oh, we're going to have multiplayer. We'll figure out when we get there. Uh, <laughs> it's going to take ages. Uh, don't even try it. Uh, instead, ask someone senior or, uh, you know, figure out that, okay, since we don't have a multiplayer expert on our team, maybe this is not the kind of game we should make. Cool. Well, it depends on the platform as well. If you're doing mobile games, which I imagine that 99% of people here are not doing, you guys really like your PC. <laughs> but if you're doing mobile games, it's break it to the simplest core loop prototype that tested, and then you can grow from that. In PC and console, I would say, Try an MVP, maybe one level of your game. You're going to have a feel of how long it took for you to do that level, and then you can scope it for the whole game. Um, you, yeah, but it's, they are spot on on that. Yeah. All right. I hope that answers the question and gives you some guidance going forward. Uh, yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Thank question. you. Excellent. Um, all right. I think that's all the time we have. If somebody has a really important question, really urgent question, I might allow it. Can I hijack the panel? Yeah, <laughs> come on, of Do course. It. Yeah, uh, so something I really wanted to talk about as another challenge, uh, which we've kind of talked about what happens, like, uh, I guess, when you're making a game and project and so on, but I think we need, really need to talk about, like, surviving. Uh, <laughs> as in, uh, like, uh, the biggest gap here when you like, if you're from the university here and you've just graduated and you go into the incubator and you're thinking like, we're going to do this game, we're going to do great, or like hopefully do great and see if that gives us success and then maybe it fails and then your whole gang disappears. Uh, I think you need to have a plan for how do you get money? Uh, how do you survive this stage? So uh, like some people, uh, you know, they continue studying, but that means they're sharing studying with trying to work, so that's very stressful. They don't get as much work done. Some people have money saved up, that's a big risk you're taking. And some people are born rich, which is, as you know, Iron Gate said, that's the best solution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know if you guys have any other insights. I think it's also uh, mitigating what is survival for most people. Like, I am a foreigner in Sweden, and the first thing that blew my mind is, how much do you guys think a startup salary is? Like uh, Rami was talking about 5,000 euros, and I'm like, what? Like in Finland, the people survive with 800 euros. You guys are talking about 5,000 euros. It's kind of holy moly. And usually the salaries in Sweden are a lot higher. 
than anywhere else. So I would say like adding to that is how lean can you go in your first year, in your second year to have, uh, to be able to survive as a game developer and have a all right uh, type of living. Because if you get into this business thinking you're gonna get 30,000 krona per month in your first year is kind of like, no. Like I worked for free for like years until I could actually make a living out of it. And I did it gladly. It, it, but it's kind of mitigating these realities and, and expectations for you to, to hold on for the long run. That's all. But no, I don't have a solution for the how to get money. <laughs> but what you say about keeping it lean, you can also think of that as an investment. I could go work for this boring job and make more money, but I invest the difference into my own business or project. Yeah, and it makes it easier to be invested because if you need 500,000 krona per month to keep your company, it's like it's really hard to get. You, Calculated for a year plus the 30 percent that Rami said, and where the heck are you going to get this money? It's a lot of money. But if you can keep your team small and your investment really lean and you can maybe survive it with 30 percent of that, you might be able to get the investment easier until you can get a proof of concept or even if, I don't know, it's, it's really complicated. In, in, in Sweden and Finland and in the Nordics, you have the advantage that you have Almi, you have Vinova, you have other ways of getting money. The banks here are really friendly, I do, although I'm not gonna advocate for people to put themselves in debt. But you have other ways, like where I come from is even worse, we have nothing, you pretty much I'm Brazilian, by the way, in Brazil we have absolutely nothing. Is you work during the day and make games overnight to somehow at some point be able to make money out of it. Yeah, Per, you will have the last say on this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm all for, I mean, going lean and everything, but I've seen so many teams crack up uh, over the years uh doing it lean by themselves uh and and usually the people that are leaving are programmers because programmers are always hot on the market uh because they can just you know say that i need a job i need money and they get a job and uh, so that's i would say that is a risk uh proposing that for an investor to say that we are going lean and they see that the team uh, consists of two or three programmers and they will not take it seriously yeah, in the worst no, but case. That's a, I'm not saying on no. that. If you're going to an investor, yeah. you, have, you have to go. But I mean, for you to be able to create your, maybe your first prototype that you can go to an investor, then I would say get, yeah. getting like, you, you know, like, it, yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. things before uh, yes. that, yeah. But okay, great. But Finally, some right. disagreement on this panel. <laughs> and it's, it's when I have to step in and, and cut you short. Folks, yeah. I could do this all day. I love it. Uh, wait, we have been doing this all day. <laughs> and we'll do more of it tomorrow. But I hear music starting to play outside. I know there's uh, maybe something, some refreshments waiting. Uh, before I let you go, I want to close on the same optimistic note as the other panels today, which is why do you, what makes you wake up in the morning and, uh, and do the things you do with games? So, uh, Per, what, 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 what makes you get out of bed in the morning? Yeah, for me, I would say it's, uh, it's revigorating. Is that a word? Like, I'm, I'm getting old and I get to work with young people with creative minds. Uh, I would say that that's yeah. very stimulating, I would say. And right. see these guys growing and uh, talk to Matthias today and uh, it was, yeah, it's, it's really nice to see these people grow up. Excellent. Yeah. Patti. I, I like the idea that everything I did in my life at some point is uh, useful for other people. Like it, it's gonna sound bad, but I really love the idea of breaking and breaking them and building them back in some way, like breaking false expectations, but also building like realistic ways that they can really do what they love and seeing people being able to do what they love. It's, it's really cool. Cool, thanks, Matthias. 
I would have to say like waking up every morning knowing that I will be creating some more magic. And I, I really liked what, or as Rami says, it, it lying to people, which is, uh, I think it's the same. <laughs> yes, the illusion. Yeah, uh, I'm just a very curious person. I want to get up in the morning and see what my team can achieve that day and what, you know, our game will start to look like next. I'm just, there's always some new stuff around the corner. I want to see it. Excellent. All right. So um, stay, stay curious. Uh, Maybe in the immortal words of Twisted Sister, stay hungry. Um, uh, and uh, thank you so much. You should uh, stay hungry for a little while longer before you get some dinner someplace, maybe at this location. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's been great to share these moments with you. I hope that you have taken all the wisdom or some of the wisdom that has been shared in this panel and before and integrated it into your own work and your own plans. And uh, I hope to see you soon. Do make something great tonight and tomorrow and the day after that. And uh, what a panel. Thanks so much for sharing. Thank you.